So in this video, I want to go over uh, my solution for the kind of latter parts of project four. So uh, here's the file. So I need to uh, change the uh, working directory to somewhere where I have this data slash crop 128 folder. So I'm going to be, going, going to be working with crop 128. Uh, so what I'm doing here is I'm reading in the list of all the files. So you probably did something similar. Uh, so you'll note that uh, when I'm doing list there in path, what I'll get is just a list of the files. So in order to actually access the file, I need to say like in path plus, for example, this file in order to access it from current directory. So what I'm doing next is I'm going through every one of those file names. I'm extracting the name from it. So for example, from Daniel Radcliffe31.png, I'll extract just Daniel Radcliffe. And then I say, well, if name is not in this dictionary, dictionary all name ends, then I'll add it in and I'll increment the end by one. So essentially what it does is I'm starting with end equals zero. And then I'm saying, oh, if I haven't seen this name yet, I'll assign the index zero to it if I start with zero uh, to this name and then I'll increment index so the next time that we do this assignment I'll assign index one so if I run this uh, I can have all name ends uh, what I'll have is some kind of ordering for for the names that I'm going to be using later on so just to kind of quickly give you the idea for file name to name so here I'm saying result is the empty string and then I'm saying I'll split it up by the period so that they'll get for example for example Daniel Rat with 50 and then PNG as the second element to just get the first element that's Daniel Rat with 50 and now I'm going through every character and if it's numeric I add it to res uh, not numeric rather than added to res, if not, then not. So at the end, I'll get Daniel Radcliffe as res, which is what I'm returning. Okay. So, all right, with that out of the way, I'm ready to actually define my, um, uh, uh, my data here. So this would be the entire data set. So the way I'll do it is I'll define uh, a uh, NumPy array that's that has as many rows as I have files. So each row is going to be a file and then as many columns as I have pixels in each of the images. Okay. So each uh, row in this data X is going to be one image flattened and then data Y is going to be kind of the corresponding Y and I want it to be like the integers zero, one, two, three, four, five. Okay. So now I'll just go through M list. Uh, so this enumerate just kind of it puts the file names in order in file name and also i goes from zero to one to two to three and so on so that they know into which row to put the image that i'm reading in so i'm reading in the image i'm converting it to grayscale so there is actually a function that does it that i import it and then i'm saying the i row of data x is going to be the flattened grayscale image. The data y at i is going to be the appropriate index, right? So if file name, for example, here's Daniel Radcliffe, then file name to name uh, is going to be this, right? So now I'll, I can get the index that corresponds to Daniel Radcliffe, which would be two. Okay, so kind of for i equals zero, I'll put in data y at zero is equal to two because the second image is of the array. So, okay. Uh, so next up, uh, I'll do the train validation test split. And the way I'll do it is, so I'll define my uh, uh, array of indices. This is gonna be zero through the length of the data. So zero through eight of five. Then I'll permute it randomly. So I'll get something like this. And this is what gets assigned to IDX. And now I get train IDX, the first 600 indices, then valid IDX, the next 100, and test IDX, uh, whatever is left over, also about 800. Okay. So, and to be consistent, I'll do np.random to see the zero so that every time I rerun this thing, I'll get the same results. So here are my indices. At this point, I'm ready to define my training validation test sets. So I'll just go 
you know, train x is equal to this and train y is equal to this. Uh, so the reason I'm doing this with a co with a comma thing is just because it kind of looks nice. Uh, I could also equally have done this uh, in six lines. So this notation just means put this in this and put this in this. Okay. So now I can run this. Uh, so now the usual thing. So I'll now read this into PyTorch variables. So just kind of like all of those six things I'll read into PyTorch variables. Cool. Uh, so now I kind of made the function so that it's easier to rerun the training. So the function is going to take kind of all of those variables. I'm just going to pass them in. Uh, it'll then define the model, uh, define the loss function. So the cross entropy, the optimizer, whatever. Um, so this is really unnecessary. Uh, so I'll comment this out for now. So then what I'll do is I'll keep track of my train accuracies and validation accuracies. Uh, so here and train, this would be the number of training samples to use. So this is for use later when I don't want to use the entire training set. I just want to use a subset of the training set to see, uh, how that affects my performance. So here, like it's the usual thing that we've done. So uh, I'm plugging in all of my X's in the training set. I'm getting the predictions currently with the current weights, computing the loss. Uh, so here I'm adding lambda times torch norm model zero. So what that means is I'm only trying to keep the weights that are connecting the inputs to the uh, hidden layer small. I'm not constraining. So I'm not penalizing large weights that go from the uh, hidden layer to the output layer. Uh, so the reason I'm doing this is kind of, I don't have very many uh, hidden units. Uh, so I don't want kind of the templates that the hidden units are matching to kind of go crazy and be far away from zero, but I don't really care about the upper, uh, the upper layer. Uh, so this is like a small choice that makes the pictures a little bit nicer. Uh, so uh, the pictures, I mean, the visualizations of the weights. Uh, so then I'm also computing the predictions for the validation set, the, the current weights, and then I'm computing the train accuracy, the validation accuracy. I'm appending the train accuracy to my list of train accuracies, appending the validation accuracy to my list of validation accuracies, and now I'm doing the step. Uh, so here I'm actually printing stuff, stuff out kind of as I'm running things, and that's just kind of for me to be able to keep track of what's going on. It's a little bit easier that way if you're printing things out so that you know that you're stuck, like you don't have to wait for like 30 minutes uh, to find out that you are stuck. You can kind of see right away. So I'm printing out kind of which iteration it is. I'm printing out the current loss. So this we've seen before where when you're kind of uh, getting data out of the, of the torch variable into NumPy, you need to like reshape it into a vector so that you can then extract the one number from there. It was like, this is a very complicated way to get the one number that's actually stored in loss. And I'm also printing the train accuracy and the validation accuracy. So another thing I'm doing is I'm displaying the weights. So the weights that are uh, connecting the input layer to the hidden layer. So those would be kind of the templates. If you have like 30 hidden units, then you have um, those 30 templates that you're matching to the input and the hidden units uh, correspond to kind of how much does the input look in some sense, like the template that corresponds to the hidden unit. Uh, so I have this function display weights that's actually over here. Uh, so, and what it does, it displays the weights in, in a five by six grid. Uh, so I think all of you have done this. Uh, so here, what it is, like I removed the text, meaning kind of like the uh, numbers along the X and the Y axis, uh, just to make it look nicer. And I did it in a loop. loop. So uh, here, we kind of go kind of, you know, we have five rows, J columns, and we say like image number K and then increment K every time. Um, so, and here we're getting like the K, uh, so the K minus first output, uh, sorry, the K minus first set of weights. And the reason is we started with K equals one. So we want to do zero as well. So that's why it's K minus one. So, okay. Uh, so, Another thing that uh, you'll notice that I'm doing, so I'm just defining this now, 
Uh, so another thing that you'll notice that I'm doing here is I'm saying if t is smaller than 100 or t mod 50 equals to zero. So that what it means is that if I'm in the first 100 iterations, I'm going to display every time. Uh, and then I'm going to display if it's 100 and 150, 200, 250, and so on, but not otherwise. And that just so that uh, kind of I can see what's going on and things aren't going too fast, like aren't printing too fast because it's skipping over iterations. So, okay. Uh, so here my uh, input is going to be M size by M size, right? Because I kind of converted the images to grayscale and uh, I just then flattened them. So each input vector is of this size. Dim out. So here I say length all names ends. Uh, I could have just said six, I suppose, uh, but it's nice to know that this is of the correct length. So this is this, if you remember. And now I want uh, 30 hidden units. Uh, I'll say that I want 1500 iterations at first, and I'll say the learning rate is like this. Uh, the lambda at first, I'll set it to this. And the end train, initially, I'll just set it to the length of train x, meaning like the entire training set. So end train, if you remember, is the, like we're taking all the training examples from number zero to number n trains. So here I'm saying take all the uh, the entire training set because length of train x is just the number of rows in train x, so the number of training examples. Uh, so let's run this. Uh, so as you remember, I was displaying the weights. Uh, and here, uh, what I did is I'm saving them to a file every time. So the way I'm accomplishing this is using this plt.savefig. So if you say like plt.figure, then say like save fig, whatever is the last figure, that's what's going to be saved. Uh, so you can see it right now, but once it gets going, if it does get going, uh, we'll see, uh, I see that it has. Uh, so you'll see the weights actually evolving in real time. So let's give it kind of a couple seconds and see what happens. Okay, so as you see over here, so the train accuracy and the validation accuracy are going up. Uh, the weights still don't really look like anything though. So it's going to be kind of maybe a few more seconds. Um, so I'll po pause the recording and resume once something interesting happens. Okay, so I've resumed the recording and as you can see the accuracy, so we are now at iteration 400, the accuracy is now at 30% and as you see the uh, weights uh, start to actually resemble faces. So that's kind of cool. Uh, I'll pause again. Uh, so I set it up to uh, run until iteration 1500. Uh, as you can see, there's progress being made, but it's being made kind of slowly. So the performance improves uh, and the uh, weights do kind of look like faces, but things are slow. So I can also show you the um, uh, learning curves that we got. So. As you see, I'm uh, sorry, this is like the old training curves. So uh, here I'll, so because I got my uh, train accuracies and validation accuracies, I can output this to a file. So as you see, I can do it with PLT figure and then I output whatever it is that I want to output. And here's what we have. Uh, so here what you would say is, okay, so it looks like the training is slowing down, but the performance is still improving, the test, the uh, validation rather performance is still improving, so this should read validation actually. Rerun this so that we don't say something that's wrong. Uh, so the validation performance is also seemingly improving. So one thing you could do here is you could just say, well, like maybe I should just run it for more iterations, or you could say maybe I should just increase the learning rate, maybe that's gonna give me uh, faster convergence. So I so I increased the learning rate by a factor of 100 and now I'm hoping that things are going to go faster. So let's see what happens. 
so as you can see things are kind of going faster but they actually jumped from a performance of 0.10 to 0.05 so it looks like this learning rate is kind of too large so I'm kind of oscillating between improving and not improving so I'll stop uh, and I'll make the learning rate kind of smaller and see if that gets me anywhere so here again something we haven't seen before is that the performance is oscillating but now it seems like uh, we are getting to um, better performance faster so um, I waited a while and as you see uh, we are now at training accuracy 1.0 and valid validation accuracy 0.86 uh, so I would still wait a bit because it might be possible, in fact it has happened, that the validation accuracy will improve even though the training accuracy is, is, is already at 1.0. And the reason it might happen is because the loss is still going down, so we're still predicting, doing a better job of predicting, in the sense that we're assigning higher probabilities to the right answer and lower probabilities to the wrong answer which might actually help with the validation accuracy, at least until the time that we start overfitting. So here you see we climbed uh, actually up to 87, so doing good. So okay, uh, so we can again display uh, the um, learning curves here, so they look like this. So as you see, there was kind of like a big jump here where we finally found uh, uh, kind of the good set of weights. Uh, so it's a little bit unusual to see that. Uh, part of it is that we skipped, skipped we kind of, uh, I don't know, sorry, so this was just like one iteration. Uh, so what we see here is that actually maybe it's possible that we, if we kept training, we'll actually we would actually get better performance still because you see like we were like at 85, now we're at 86, and now we're at 87. Uh, so I might argue, well, like maybe maybe we should train more. Uh, with that with that said, for the purposes of this exercise, I'd say we're done and we want to report kind of uh, the performance on the test set. Uh, so we can do that. So I'll just run this to predict the performance on the test set. Now that is something that you would only do at the end, but I'm going to kind of erase uh, th those weights and try other things. So I'll just report it. And as you can see here, we kind of got lucky and we got a test accuracy of 94%. Uh, so doing pretty good. So, okay. So one thing though uh, is if you look at those weights you see that here this is kind of like white noise right so white noise kind of just refers to like every pixel is random it doesn't look like those weights are being used so one kind of hypothesis about why that might happen is that the initialization for those sets of weights is so far off from what a good initialization would be that uh, the gra gradient and descent algorithm never actually manages to get at kind of a good value for those weights if by good value i mean something that would be useful for classifying faces uh, it might be that some of those only look like uh, white noise we won't investigate instead what i want to do is i just want to try something so i'll say here so uh instead of just say letting pytorch initialize randomly the weights we'll say, oh, I want the weights initially to be really, really small. 
And the idea is if they're really, really small, then they're not so far away from something that would be useful uh, for classification that gradient descent won't figure it out. So let's try it. So I'll just divide them by like a lot, this much. Uh, let me reinitialize the train classifier. I'll be, uh, read it in rather than not initialize. And now we'll train it again. Uh, so same thing. So, and here we want to look at the weights. And as you can see, uh, actually, sorry. So uh, those were kind of like this from the beginning. So let me show you what they looked like uh, as they were actually evolving. So I'll train it again and I'll put the training on again and I'll display the weights right away. Oops. Okay, so we started like this. And as you see, because we started with very small values, actually the training process gets to stuff that looks a lot like faces very fast. So that's kind of cool. So otherwise though, you'll get kind of pretty much the same result, whatever kind of the initialization that you're using. So we'll fast forward to the end here. So at this point, uh, it turned out that uh, things look about the same, except kind of for those things. Uh, so uh, I still kind of want to get like nicer weights. So I might say, well, like maybe I want a learning rate that's a, bit, a little bit smaller so that uh, I kind of don't zigzag along the uh, surface of the cost function so much. Maybe that'll get me nicer pictures. If it doesn't, I'll just move on. So I'll make it smaller by this much and I'll rerun things. So here you can see that it does manage to kind of copy faces much better than before because I made the learning rate kind of smaller. So here you see like this is clearly like from like a particular face, this is from a particular face. But we're still at kind of very high loss, very low accuracy. Oh, so here it copied stuff as well. Okay, it copied apparently it really likes this face for some reason. So there was progress there, but not enough. But you see that performance has been improving and you see that it has been copying the face. So one thing to note here is that the performance is like 15%, uh, which means that it's kind of like as good as guessing. My guess is that just always outputs uh, the, the thing that corresponds to those templates. Uh, you could run it for more iterations and uh, get nicer results. Uh, so we'll try one last thing. Well, so I'll increase the learning rate because apparently that was too small, but I'll make the lambda non-zero so as to encourage the weights to be uh, closer to zero. So let me run this and see how that works out. So here you see kind of much faster movement. And you again see that it's trying to copy various things. Although, as you see, the accuracy is still kind of small. So I'll need to run it for longer. So what you see is because I uh, added this uh, regularization, so, so lambda before it's zero, now it's not zero, I get those kind of very smooth uh, uh, templates that are very close to zero. 
Although we still haven't managed to make the white noise templates uh, actually look like faces. So, okay. So uh, before you might remember, we got kind of like 86% on the validation set. So um, would it be the same if we reduced the size of the training set? I'll set the lambda back to zero and I'll, I'll increase the learning rate a little bit. And what I'll do is I'll say, I want the end train, so the number of training examples to be now 300, so half of what it was. So I'll do it like round like this, and I'll run it. So the smaller the training set, uh, the faster you would expect the training to go, as you see it is going faster, and the more you expect the uh, uh, kind of templates, so the uh, weight components that are going to the hidden layer, to look like uh, individual examples. Because if you have very few examples, then of course, kind of as far as classifying the training set, the most efficient thing to do would be to just copy the examples from the training set to the uh, sets of weights. So we are at iteration 700 and we basically converge to the same kind of minimum. So the performance is like very slightly worse in the validation set uh, than it was before. And as you see, it is decreasing a little bit. So that's like, if it were to decrease a lot more, that would be kind of the case for saying, well, like maybe you should set Lambda to not be zero. Maybe you should do regularization to prevent overfitting. Uh, here though, uh, kind of the difference between 86 and 84, we we're talking like two examples that we got wrong. Um, so you could try regularization. It's not clear to me that it would actually make things better. So that's what we get uh, if we use uh, one half of the uh, training set, not very much overfitting at all, and basically the same performance. Uh, so what if we use 10% of the training set? So again, let's start, it, start it up. So here we expect that the training should go much faster. And we expect that the weights would look more like, more like individual examples. So here we are, so situation 10. So as you see, the training accuracy here is already kind of higher than the validation accuracy. We'd expect this discrepancy to rise as the model starts resetting the data. So as you can see, we settled on uh, kind of the training accuracy is now kind of one. Uh, the validation accuracy, though, is right now at 0 0.69. Uh, might go up a little bit, might go down a little bit. Uh, let's see. So it went up to 0 0.7. Uh, so note here that, like, again, we're not actually, it's not clear that we're observing that much overfitting because the validation accuracy still goes up. So there's not really much of a case for uh, turning lambda up to something that's not zero. Uh, another thing you see is that the loss is smaller. No, that kind of makes sense because it's easier to fit a, a smaller training set. So let's try a really small training set. So let's say that our training set is going to be I don't know, 50. Here you see we're copying multiple examples from the training set. Well, still kind of in the early stages of training here, we're still getting just 20% train accuracy. So 
So interestingly, in this case, even with just 15 examples, as you see, they're doing pretty good. So like you have a 15%, 16% probability of just guessing, and we're getting about 67% correct. Uh, as you see here, the templates do mostly look just like individual faces. And here you might imagine that if you really tune the training, you would be able to get like all 15 of the examples. So here you see that there might be a slight bit of overfitting. So let's finally just try a really small number of examples. Let's say we just go for like eight. And let's see what happens. So we are already at 0 0.5 accuracy after 10 iterations. We are kind of copying really the images verbatim. So at least this one and this one seems like almost verbatim. So another interesting thing to see here is we're getting 50% accuracy on the training set, but 0 0.03 on the validation set, which is 3% of the validation set we're getting correct, so we are overfitting really, really severely, actually. We're still waiting to get a better train accuracy than 0 0.5, but as you see, the loss is going down, so we'll see uh, better performance pretty soon. So we are now up to an accuracy of 1, and a validation accuracy of 0 0.57. Uh, probably will not get better. Uh, so as you can see, kind of the smaller the training set, the worse your performance, but in this case, even a really small training set, like just like eight examples, uh, is getting us a validation accuracy of 57%, when the baseline is 0.16, that's not so bad at all.